Let's see. Okay, so what happened to the little note? Okay, well, anyway. Well, it told us we're recording. Hi, everybody. Um, we are going to take a look at Cy Twombly, um, who is, you know, uh, a visionary, to say the least. He died in 2011, so it hasn't been that long. It's been 10 years since he died, and his work for a lot of people is really life altering. Um, there are some things to talk about with Sai's work, but I thought we'd start with another video. Um, this is gonna be one of our harder um, abstract classes because it's gonna really take, um, when I talk about the concept of developing your own visual language, he really depends a lot on that. Um, he created, his own visual language. And then his paintings, which look like these big scribble paintings, were actually paintings addressing some of the, you know, biggest mythological stories of all time and really looking deep into these existential questions that people had. And so we're going to do a couple of um, exercises today. Um, we're going to watch this video first so you guys can get kind of a glimpse. We're going to talk about some of my favorite of his pieces. I have um, tabbed them up so that we can look at them. And then we're gonna talk about how you're gonna work. It may take the whole class, but how you're gonna work on taking um, a story of your own life and basically narrowing it down into the very most basic elements and trying to create a good visual composition. It's gonna take some really solid color theory and it's gonna take some understanding of what's happening on your paper to, to be successful. You guys might not be successful. It also may feel a little bit like um, this class, you know, like you don't know what you're supposed to be doing. And that is gonna be kind of how it is sometimes. The positives, Cy Twombly painted and drew with everything. He is no, his work is literally deteriorating um, because he used house paints and he used non, you know, non archival materials. Um, he used crayons and he was definitely known for like taking long periods of time and hiding in other countries and doing entire bodies of work that were really just about his own psychological process. Um, he's, it's exceptional his work because he, he connects really well with his child self. And that is, you know, is, is a remarkable thing for an abstract painter. So I'm gonna start this video. I'm gonna share my screen first. Okay, and we're gonna, I haven't fully watched this one, but I wanted you guys to have the maximum amount of access to the work, you know? Hold on. Many times from people who are trying to discredit modern art from Pollock to Malevich all the way to Picasso, who was famously quoted for saying, it took me four years to paint like Raphael, but a lifetime to paint like a child. Mm -hmm. So perhaps, yes, your toddler could have painted that, or maybe, as Susie Hodge suggests, they couldn't. But this video isn't about the artistic talent of your toddler, but about an artist who, <laughs> when I first saw his paintings, I immediately thought, if I had a toddler, they would be able to paint that. We'll be taking a look at abstract expressionist Cy Twombly. At the start of his career, Twombly was extremely influenced by Black Mountain College artists such as Franz Klein and Robert Motherwell. For example, we can look at his 1951 Zig, made when he was only 23 years old, and compare it to Klein's compositions. He later developed a more unique style in 1955 with, notably, Academy. Instead of using paint like any other popular abstract expressionist of the time, Twombly decided to mark his canvas with pencils. It's hard to tell what's going on. It looks dirty, graffiti-like, rushed, and free. To be honest, the first image that came to mind when I saw this painting was an old bathroom stall where visitors clumsily scratched indecipherable messages on its wall. 
<laughs> the reason why these lines could be messages instead of random marks is that we can see, if we look closely and attentively, many different letters and sometimes even words. The only one I could find, for example, is here. <laughs> but Twombly didn't stop there. He still innovated and found new ways to paint subjects that mattered to him. For example, poetry and ancient mythology was one of his main inspirations. This passion for ancient mythology translated in his 1962 Leda and the Swan, a myth in which Zeus turned into a swan to seduce Leda. He would then, still as a swan, have intercourse with her. Here, the image explodes and violently spreads out to each edge of the canvas. The few recognizable things are the title at the bottom right of the painting, hearts symbolizing seduction, and finally, a window. The window is the only thing that really looks out of place, and it's really hard to tell why it's there. Just like in Academy, the longer you look at this painting, the more you'll find different elements that help you understand it, yet it will still leave you puzzled. Finally, this leads to the series of paintings you may know Twombly for, which also ties in with the idea that your toddler could do it. This is his series of paintings reproducing what looks like chalkboards. For example, Twombly would, with wax crayons, imitate some polymer method exercises, which are drills aimed at improving your handwriting. Here, you can follow the artist's movement, its repetition, its rhythm, and as you go along, you can feel that rhythm accelerating. The strokes get more and more violent. They get stretched out in a crescendo of action and finally, Twombly impatiently covers the blackboard with marks, applying them with as much gesture as possible. This final violent phase will be echoed in Twombly's two last series titled Bacchus, made between 2003 and 2008, and Camino Real, which will be his final paintings before his death in 2011. Twombly's work truly captivates me, but to be honest, I don't really know why. <laughs> why do I find Twombly's movement more interesting than, say, Pollock's? Maybe it could be the repetition, the rhythm, or the idea that by looking long enough at a Twombly, you start seeing encrypted messages. When I look at one of these paintings, I feel like we're on the brink of a formulated thought. Something is about to reveal itself. We're almost there. We just need a couple more words, just a couple more letters. Perhaps this is why I'm entranced by Twombly's work. I don't necessarily understand it now, but I feel like I'm about to. <laughs> Maybe just looking for a couple more minutes will allow me to see something more find a word, find an image, find a feeling. Twombly's paintings have this ability to prompt curiosity. Thank you for watching. We'd like to thank Isak and all of our supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to join them in their support, check us out at patreon.com forward slash. Now you can see a bit about why uh, this class might be somewhat harder than other classes. It can be hard to um, find our most childlike self, especially when we talk about something that looks like um, really a bunch of jibber jabber. Hold on, we're going to give me a second. Mm -hmm. yeah. So one of my one of the things that i want you guys to think about one of the exercises i want you guys to practice actually the reason that we ended up looking at size work is that the exercise of how to develop handwriting came up in conversation with my girlfriend's mother uh last week and it made me think about some of the things that um previous generations have had to do as exercises that current generations don't have to do and the ways in which artists tend to bring those things that we are um, feel childlike about into our work. 
And that repetition, that handwriting exercise was one of the things that came up. Um, I do an exercise often with uh, my classes at the beginning of my, um, hold on, I realized I forgot one of my materials. Give me a second. Oh. Okay, sorry about that. So one of the exercises that we often do at the beginning of um, any workshop that I do is what I call rage scribbling. And we talked about it in the, the basics. And honestly, the concept of rage scribbling is very much based off of that the same handwriting exercises that um, they talked about in relation to what Sai is doing. And why, why it's important is there is so much to be learned from people about or about people from the weight of their mark. There's a lot of performance art that's done with drawing and tying people's hands together and then they have to communicate together. Um, and so rage scribbling is meant to be very similar, like this way of getting out the nerves and kind of the jitters of um, starting a new painting. With size work, it ends up kind of coming in almost as collage fodder, which is something that we're gonna be working with today is kind of creating our own um, collage materials and then trying to take a story, either a story that you know, or a story about your own life or a person in your own life and kind of creating a piece about them, right? So um, I'm going to use my super melted, awesomely water soluble graphite sticks. And rage scribbling is really just, usually you do it to a really powerful song, song that really gets you pumped, that makes you kind of want to, ah, you know, and you, you know, the idea is, is that you're capturing that, the exit of that information onto your page. Now, if you look at, at Sai's work, something that you notice is that he starts really like consistent and slow. He's working through it. He's trying to get these marks down, right? And, and then they're with time heating up. So ridge scribbling isn't meant to be so much in lines like Sai's work. It's meant to be really out of control like women should be you know, just really anywhere. And the idea is we're loosening up. We're getting the gel out of our, you know, muscles that's holding us in. We're also getting a little bit of freaked out in this, also a little bit of a wildness out, okay? And then we're gonna use some of these pieces that we're creating these marks on in our collage later today. So if you would like to get a little bit of extra miss out and start to access your inner child, which is a very important person to be able to be in contact with if you want to be an abstract painter, this is a great way to do it. I would suggest it to just about everyone. I always use a water soluble graphite um, pencil because then I can smear it. You know, I can make the, the pencil look a little bit different. You can do words. You can say, you can write the word fuck across your page a thousand times overlapping itself or love. Um, when I did my uh, grant project a couple years ago that was about trauma. I wrote letters to my relatives that the paintings were about and they were in the back and they were part of this process. Um, so today we are going to be keeping in mind and keeping in, oh, this is so funny. I created little tiny marks that you guys can barely see from my pencil being underneath my paper while I was rage scribbling on it, which seems even more side twombly to me than it was gonna be before. I did wanna share some of my favorite side twombly pieces so that we can talk about them together and talk about the ways that he tells stories. Sometimes it can feel so foreign when people, when abstract artists say, my work tells stories, but really how are those crazy hash marks or weird splotches or random-ish words like my, one of our artists from Portland Open Studios, I went and saw a painting of hers and it says cake. That's what it says, that's what's written. But there's something so endearing about it. You immediately think about all of your experiences about cake. And then what she has done is because she's the kind of painter that does a ton of backgrounds and then masks in little weird designs. And there are all kinds of little mini cakes on the, the painting with the word cake. We don't know what Sam was thinking about when she did cake. Does she just love cake? Was this an experience that had to do with cake? Uh, is cake a metaphor for something else? With Sai's work, 
generally everything on his page has intention. This is where it gets hard. We're gonna need to distill down these ideas that we have for our expression into little tiny moments that mean something. That means you have to make your decisions with intention. When you choose your colors, your colors have to relate to the work that you're creating. Nothing is just done by accident. Hence the reason we're gonna do tiny little collages because they help us filter through some of that first. So we're going to look at one of my favorite, which is actually one of his oldest ones is from the seventies. Um, hold on, sorry. Woo. And it's called Pan. And it's about the story of Pan, um, the little woodland nymph. We can see here that for some reason he collaged some sort of illustrated um, leaves, maybe to, to relate to Pan's woodland nymphishness. And he wrote Pan here and he wrote panic down here. And then we have this little interesting smudge. What I find so intriguing about this particular painting is that Personally, when I read stories about Pan, he's such a troublemaker. He feels to me like a character that is a little out of control, which is the whole point of him, right? And panic is something that it makes me feel. I genuinely feel that way about Pan. Um, and I'm a very intrigued by kind of this concept of how he puts this all together and everything has intention. I also wanna show you just the massiveness of the 50 days at Ilium, which is that um, the one of the displays that he shows. When you consider these pieces aren't this size of paper, they're full rooms. You're spending, and he's spending the time um, really being in the moment. My favorite um, series is from the 50 days at, at Ilium. And it is a series that he painted. These are part of the series, but my favorite painting is Achilles Shield. And the reason it's one of my favorite paintings, we're gonna, I don't think I have it marked, but we can pull it up because it's so beautiful. Um, the reason I think it's so important is they have a documentation. This is the painting. It can seem so simple. It can seem almost like, he just sat down and did this in one day and it came out. But they have proof that he did like 150 sketches of exactly how he wanted Achilles shield to look. Um, and obviously the particular series is about Plato and his school and he brings in Achilles to it. And it's very esoteric. Um, and it's very interesting how we can have something that can feel so simple and can feel so basic really. And it's actually something that is really well-intentioned and you can see the, all the different versions. They have like 150 different versions of Achilles shield because it really took him a long time to figure out exactly how he wanted it to look. I mean, obviously with all artists, there's also this notion that like he liked to paint penises. He liked to uh, you know, he was very that kind of man about it, um, which is, it is what it is. And we're not, we're not going to be doing that today in our work. <laughs> okay, so I want you to start with, so we're going to be making tiny little collages like Pan. I want you to think of something in your life, whether it's a person or it's a story or a moment, or even, you know, like I said, I was reading that book and like I'm very attached to that book, it could be a poem. Um, Mary Oliver poems are a great idea. Um, and then I want you to try and figure out what does it mean through color and mark and word, text, keep your text simple to try and create it in a very small space. You wanna leave a lot of room on your page, consider how negative space plays into your story, but you're gonna to have to start by making basic collage stuff. So it's gonna be some of this scribbling that, that we talked about. Um, and then you're gonna to want to cut it up and or piece it out when you get it figured out what your words are gonna be. Everything has to be with intention though. So you need to, to really think about what you're trying to communicate, what story you're trying to talk about um, and how that plays out. My mom came to visit. And while that is both wonderful, is also super very stressful. And my mother really wanted to go through um, our like old stuff, 
you know, and that's fine, except for I'm 40 years old and I have a different perspective than my mom has about that old stuff. So I am thinking that today, the, the thing I'm gonna work on is that stuff, okay? And the story basically goes is that when I was a senior in high school, my mom um, had a full mental breakdown because she was in some really serious therapy as she was graduating law school and she was hallucinating and going through this trauma experience. And I was the child parent. So I had to get my, make sure that my sibling got to school. I had to get the groceries and, and do all the things. So really it's about, the concept is about my mom, who was at the time 38, uh, trying to manage two children and having a full mental breakdown. So I, um, in thinking about this really hard and thinking about who my mom is, I obviously brought in some fluorescent magenta because what speaks about trauma and anger and uh, just shared, shared history, like fluorescent magenta, nothing, obviously. Um, I also got myself some quinacridone burnt orange. I'm not really sure um, how much I'm gonna use. I got a muted pink, and then I've got some really nice green gold. The reason I had to bring crayons is crayons create a resist. So some of your scribble marks, you can then, you will find that then watercolor on top of those things will create a, like a resist and it will come off of them. It's a different effect. It's an effect that will work really well for this. My suggestions for you, have one focal point in your painting that is a color, that is a basic thing, like similar to Achilles shield, some piece, have some background stuff, which will be these, like these crazy marks that I accidentally made here are gonna be perfect. And then consider a word. So you're gonna break down into three pieces. How does color play into it? How does one basic word um, like cake <laughs> play into it? And then how do you tie it together with these tiny little marks? Okay. I'm gonna suggest that you share along the way different ideas. I'm gonna, do a variety of exercises I use to make collage fodder, and then I'll start to make my collage and I'll share that with you guys as I do it. Does that sound reasonable to everyone? Do we understand what we're doing? Okay. You don't have to share your story, but if you would like to share your story, you're welcome to. Any questions? I no. Question. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have crayon because I'm just not at home today. So yeah. um, can I use colored pencil? Oh, colored pencils are great resist. Anything that's kind of waxy, honestly, will create a great resist. I want to encourage, especially with this, you get to use whatever is available to you. Ballpoint pen was one of my favorite things when I first started painting because I was comfortable with it. We've used them our whole life, right? So have yeah. color pencils are great. They're actually going to allow you to layer your colors really nicely. They're going to be very interesting and they're going to work great with your watercolors, honestly. So I think you're set up really good. Um, if you guys find any struggles, I just want to tell you, this is one of those moments with abstract art, you're just going to push through. Do a hundred or something. Create a hundred of your paint splotches. Figure out how you want to get that part out. Uh, scribble really big, scribble really small, scribble in moments and see what comes through and how we can make something interesting of it. We're never going to be as brilliant as Ty Twombly, but we can get real close. And I got to get more water because I'm running out of my voice already. Oh, I got lots of beverages now. Okay. I'm gonna take 
this off. I generally, some things that I think about when I do this kind of work is I generally like to work with a thinner paper when I'm making collage materials. Um, I think that it kind of, it allows you to collage with a little bit better because you have a little bit of translucency involved. I am gonna use just my big old glue stick today. Um, although we've talked before about different things that you can do um, and, and how you can go from there. Christia, does it matter which media you start with? No, I think that you're going to find that you need to work through kind of all of them a little bit, you know what I mean, until you find the pieces that you like. I really liked it, like the, the beginning part of this kind of exercise for me, I really like to like go just spend some time making pieces. They're going to be things that you're going to tear up and throw away and not really think about. They're meant to be, you're sifting through your brain junk right now, right? So try all kinds of things. Try some watercolors if you have them, try some acrylic paint, make you know big marks that you could cut or, or tear into small marks. Because what happens I find is that big mark, only one part of it's really intriguing um, and things like that. Give yourself some opportunity to cleanse out. This is like a meditation for yourself. So I'm gonna do some scribble stuff and then I'm gonna work with my watercolors a little bit and make some swatches for my watercolors. I'm experimenting both on this rice paper and I got regular uh, you know, watercolor mixed media paper here. Um, and then I am going to pull out some oil pastels that I have that are water soluble and work on some of my scribbles. I already know the word because I associate my mom with the word lion for a lot of reasons. So in this part of this story my mom is is the word lion represents my mom and honestly an image that comes to mind is a cage because my, i definitely think at that time my mom felt very much she was like she was in a cage i felt like i was in a cage and so i'm going to try and figure out how i can deconstruct the notion of a cage and bring in just a simple fragment of that cage to the piece so i'm going to do a little bit like i tend to work, rotate like work on this, work on the cage for a little bit, let it dry, work on some weird swatches, and then I will tear it up and kind of glue it together or piece it together until I find something that I feel like is impactful. Does that make sense? Awesome. Oh, yeah. See, this is why I have to experiment with new things. Look at this whole second page of stuff that I'm not even doing. You know, it makes amazing marks. And what weirdness is there? This is why we have to try new things. Oh, nice. Thank you. 
There's no need to see everything in the back of my studio going on. <laughs> step, and just step away for like five minutes to take a phone call, come back and stuff's happening. We're creating collage fodder, you know? We're, right. we're making stuff so that we can go on to the next step. And I'm trying to figure out what is this, what is this kind of um, emotional, field that I'd like to create. And I'm thinking with this rice paper, which I said is brand new, rather than painting on the rice paper because it's delicate, it seems like softening up paint from another surface is a better choice just due to the kind of the nature of the paper. However, this thing is drying and it's really quite- So pretty. Ah, love it. I know. Fun little exercise. Work on It can be really hard to um, let go. And one of the things that I do when I think about this and I'm doing this kind of stuff is, especially if you're taking some uh, other, Leah's other classes that are really about how you do things properly, like drawing, uh, something that you can help your brain with is not holding onto the pencil like you would draw with it, but holding it in a different way that you wouldn't necessarily draw with it. I tend to hold it like this, you know, which is a little different than I would if I was drawing it. And I don't, it's not like I hold it like this. This is what I would do if I was gonna draw, right? I hold like this, or I hold like this, you know, like you would a paintbrush. It loosens up your arm and it allows your, your marks to be a little different. I also spin the pencil when I'm drawing with it. And I think that tends to make it less controlled right you know which i mean i did a project where i put all of my paint brushes and pencils on the ends of six foot sticks and then had to work with them then and that was an experience ah. oh i remember those i remember that yeah yeah it was uh, wild and crazy and trying to get the paint onto the brush and then onto the painting was a, an experience of itself, so. I'm talking about doing an eight foot or maybe even bigger, maybe 10 foot commission. And I was just thinking, how do I paint that? What do I paint that with? <laughs> I don't know. I might paint it with a mop. <laughs> like it's okay. kind of big. That's a, it's really big, but what you're gonna really have to do is consider it like, where are you going to paint that? Oh, I'm going to paint it at their place. There's no way I can fit that in my studio. I'm like, yes, the only thing, uh, I'm like, no way. In yeah. fact, I was just last night, I was, what, this is going to sound random, but last night I was um, watching, I don't know if you guys have ever watched the documentary uh, Rumble in the Jungle, which is about I the fight between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman in 1978 yeah. in Zaire and uh, it's it's like it's riveting I don't I mean all the footage is from that time but the film wasn't like released until like the late 90s um and I you know it's funny I I knew Muhammad Ali was a great athlete like kind of an epic person but I didn't really get his magic until you see him as a young man talking blah 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 George Foreman blah 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 he got out the entire African continent of Zaire of, of, of Zaire yelling in uh, Swahili um kill George Foreman <laughs> like Ali will kill George Foreman in like, like Ali Mubadi too or whatever it was that he was yelling you know to like 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 nobody really liked George they all liked Muhammad Ali, they loved him. And Who won the fight? Uh, what? Who won the fight? I'll tell you, this is quite, cause I, you know, so 
George Foreman was by far the superior boxer. I mean, in physical strength, in size, and in, and he was a very self-contained dude. So Ali is out there like, I'm gonna you, I want to beat you up. I'm gonna get you, George. I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you. Oh, I'm gonna take you down. That's right. I am the one. I'm the master. He just goes on and on and on. And George Foreman is just like, doesn't okay. say anything, right? Like he just stands there. But he is clearly the bigger, uh, bigger person. So Ali, who's talking and talking and talking and talking, but skinny, skinny and kind of ropey compared to George Foreman, they get up and uh, George Foreman immediately starts pounding him. And there's a moment that you can see on his face that beyond all that bragging, Ali is really fucking scared. <laughs> like, like it just like you, he's like, oh, I am in here and I have to, and he kind of goes like this <sighs> and decides, all right, I'm going right towards that place. I'm going in. And he beats George Foreman. And he basically beats George Foreman after eight, by surviving eight rounds with him, beating him up. Like, like basically George just got tired. <laughs> like he was like, and like, he just kept hitting Ali until he got for eight rounds and Ali just didn't go down. He spent a lot of time kind of leaning back on the ropes, which is not something that you normally do. Uh, he went right close to him um, most of the time, but George just pounded on him until he was exhausted. And then Ali leans back one punch and boom, knocks him out. It was wow. quite incredible. Yes. And so what that made me think about was all the things you're afraid of. And I thought, I'm a little afraid of this, uh, this commission because I'm like not sure how to do it. So I thought, well, fuck it. I'm going to get it started. <laughs> so I'm well, gonna, gonna learn, started. right? Right. I'm gonna get it started. So I know where I'm gonna do it. I kind of, unfortunately, it is gonna be the St. John's Bridge. Jesus Christ, I cannot escape it. But um, I'm like, and I was you just saying, it. yeah, it's iconic. it's iconic. I mean, it's not not magical. It's not not magical. It's a magical like, bridge. That is true. It should be what this is. And I'm like just sitting there today thinking, how do I paint this? Do I paint this with um, with a mop? And I was thinking about you with your distance project doing this. And I was thinking, can I actually physically like uh, no? I have some fairly large brushes that I use on murals. And yeah, I feel like that. house paint brushes, right? Like or well, like, no, I actually use like professional level brushes mm -hmm. uh that are just really large and i feel like they give you so the problem was the distance made it really stressful and really hard physically if you get a brush yeah. that's on a big stick you're probably yeah. more likely to control yeah yeah so it's an interesting i was just thinking about it and i was thinking as you were talking about this process it made me think of that film that i saw last night if you guys can get a chance to see it it is on either Criterion Channel or Netflix or something. It's an easy thing to get. Um, it's really, you get, and you know, George Foreman is also an epic guy. Like he's not an un-epic soul. So yep. he lost, um, took him to a place that kind of transformed the person who he is today, who's kind of this real affable, kind of, you know, successful, not that he wasn't successful before. He went through a whole period of depression after losing and had to question who he was. And I don't know, people who go to that place, who go right to the fear place and they're like, I'm going in. Or yeah. I mean, imagine being in the ring with somebody who could kick your ass. <laughs> There's like nothing oh. that the entire world is watching. <laughs> Audrey and I just talked about this uh, this morning because I, I took a two week break from my training schedule for running and I started running again yesterday. And I was telling her how, you know, my second mile, I did three miles yesterday. I was like, my second mile is the mile I always lag on. So I really forced myself to push through my second mile. And then my third mile wasn't really that great. And Audrey's like, what, what it is, is that your legs can do three miles without any problem, it's your brain. And yeah. she's like, your brain was tired because you pushed it on the second mile. And so it's got this kind of concept where like, you know, Ali 
all he was able to push his brain. He was able yeah. to push his brain in that. Yeah, age. he was able to recognize his exactly his fear and go, okay, this is the I'm just gonna go. Right. Yeah, I'm gonna fuck. Do I have it? I have it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to finish. And that's, you know, this kind of exercise, even with what we're doing, like it's really about repetition. You're creating brain skill. It's also about learning to access parts of yourself that are really hard to access. Um, it's hard to let go sometimes. And I am always amazed at the ways that different movements when doing this much kind of fodder at once can, can create for me. You know, I have to have, usually have to have like this, like where I have three or four pages out and they're like really working together as they kind of create other moments and then they get taken apart of course because that's the name of the game i don't know ladies if that like resonates for you any of the things that we're talking about i don't know if you've ever seen the film i don't know if you've ever thought about the things that scare you the most um and what to do when you get there or do we try to avoid as much as possible that thing um even the story you were telling earlier today krista about you and your mom made me think about that idea about all of the things that happened to us like like trying to protect ourselves versus going that you know being in it and there and yeah. and like i don't know i don't even know how i want to put words on it but how dimensional that is as an example yeah. well and my mom and i had to have some i mean like had to have some serious conversations because i've done a lot of work around this done paintings and therapy and my mom has not had these conversations and she she said to me i was expressing to her how i felt about that about being a child that raised themselves and mind you i also one side can recognize it was really difficult for me and the other side recognizes it was really difficult for my mom and they exist in the same place you know and my mom made a comment she said well you're just giving me shit and i said i'm not giving you shit it's so disrespectful what i'm doing is sharing with you my experience and my feelings and i'm not being disrespectful i'm 100 percent owning just my experience right you know and that's it took me 40 years to get to the point to have that conversation with my mom to where I could say to her, I'm not giving you shit. I'm sharing with you my experience and you need to be respectful of, of my experience. Well, it takes her to places of guilt, which she had clearly oh. had like, like process. Oh, my mom and guilt, you know, yeah. it's their, their hand in hand, best friends, you know what I mean? Like that is a major thing. And I know that, but also I am not going to not have my experience because it makes my mom guilty. You know, that's something that took me a long time. I don't want to make her feel bad, but I need to be honest. Right. You can get past all that shit. Honestly, honesty okay. is not the worst thing. I mean, it no. can be hard in the moment, but it's so much better afterwards. Yeah. And I think that's a thing that people struggle with um, yeah. a lot. I think it's hard. You don't want to be honest. You don't want to hurt people's feelings. And so instead things just simmer and simmer and sit and you get madder and madder and madder. And then there's an explosion and it's not healthy. And um, yeah. it actually I'm, is, I think, better to be whatever, whatever. Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting. It's an interesting idea. This yeah. idea. And that's sort of what this assignment is about to, you know, in a way too. By the way, have you heard that story about the woman who kissed Cy Twombly's work and was put in jail for it or something? Because she went up to an expensive, it's somewhere in the MoMA and went in and kissed it. <laughs> like, <laughs> let's see if I can find that. If it's in the MoMA and stuff that they're probably pretty pissed about it though, let's be real. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Audrey says it happened at Tate. Oh, it happened at the Tate. That's right. Hold on. I'm looking it up. Damn. So, you know, Cy Twombly's work really speaks to my heart. Um, and it really allows me to, um, sometimes I feel challenged as an abstract painter. Like I want to tell more stories, you know? Right. I want to address some of the conversations that our gallery is having. And I think it's important that I have the ways to do that. And then 
when I'm feeling like, oh, but abstract painting just doesn't do that. And then I revisit size work. And I'm like, actually, there is ways to, to do that. He right. chose old man boring stuff. I'm choosing. It happened in 2007. A woman was at this page. She was, she actually left a lipstick print on, okay. on a, on a immaculate white canvas that is an untitled work by Cy Twombly. So it was a completely like white canvas and she leaned over and she left her lipstick print on it. She's a 30, it's a $2.7 million painting. <laughs> oh, <laughs> she's an artist. Uh, cool. Wow. The guts of people, huh? Right. She's an artist. She's 30 and she went to court and I don't know what happened to her. A kiss for Twombly is a case for the police. <laughs> she destroyed a painting. Yeah. She destroyed it. And like, that's several million dollars that that people have vested interest in. Yeah. Yeah. She kissed it. Anyway, yeah. what side she, she, she created her own work of art by doing it. That's what she would tell you. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> but, and that's what I'm she saying, I think that. It was a collaborative piece between unknown random lady artists. Inside yeah, town. right. Oh man, do you know how pissed I'd be if somebody came up and left a kiss mark on one of my paintings? I, I know you, Carista. If it was something like that, you'd probably also be like, hmm, interesting idea. <laughs> what did he do? How interesting. Well, like, I so like location matters, right? Uh, what I mean by that is, that's in a collection yeah like, yeah yeah it doesn't belong to you to make a decision about <laughs> so i'm working on my my collage here uh i have one mark that i kept from one page that i really like i have some highlights like this hot pink is really where i'm coming in on that like mom trauma situation um I do have some interesting stuff going on over here with this yellow. I don't know how it's going to play into the actual piece, um, but it, it is an idea that's inspiring some some thoughts for me. I have this stuff, but I feel like it'll make it way too busy, so I'll probably save that for another painting. Um, and then I guess we're just going to really work on how is the how is the words going to come into play here, uh, and where you know this is where you want to consider really hardcore how heavy your paper is how big of a statement you're making and where it's being made i know you guys are not do you want them to send anything across carissa they, As I know that the few people that are here aren't always the biggest fans of that but send what you want is what i'm going to say i'm what i'm going to do is i'm going to get this one going and then i'm going to send her a picture of it so you guys have an example of what I've done. And I'm gonna send some pictures of some of the other things I've created in my little my other little pages. So you guys just kind of have them for reference, but I'm not gonna require to anything today, you know. I'd love to see it. You guys, if you feel like sharing it, I'd love to see what you got. No matter what it is. No judgment, just kind of interest. <laughs> I'll send something in a second, but Krista, what kind of paper are you using? Is it heavy? Is it light? So I've got two different kinds right now. So I have a lot of feelings about the kinds I have. Um, so I have rice paper, it's super light. I don't know if you've ever used it. It's almost like tissue paper. Um, and that was when I was saying what I have to do is this is a mixed media paper. It's 182 pound, which is like super heavy. And I have to almost make imprints on the rice paper. But they're beautiful, right? And it's really delicate. And I feel like if I dipped this in paper, it would die and I could use that. So generally I, uh, I like to use like your basic, probably 90 pound mixed media for this. That's my favorite because I feel like it can hold up to what paint you're putting on it. It rips easier. It's easier to manipulate when you're, when you're putting it down. I do like the base paper to be 140 pounds or heavier though. Do you ever use smooth or? Um... Mine is smooth. Um, 
on collaging, I like it to be smooth. I do sometimes treat the paper with um, Ooh. gesso to make it have It's funny how you can have different paper needs oh. for different, yeah. but it seems to me that it, it, it adheres better to the smooth paper. These are really compelling, Jean. What, do you want to tell us anything about them or you don't have to? She's like, no, uh-uh, not telling you. But these are very- I think it's more interesting if I don't explain it, but <laughs> I'm having fun. I okay. think okay. I like this more than anything else I've seen, even that I've seen you do in this class. <laughs> You're accessing something. But, but I'm not done, so I could completely ruin them. Uh, that's the greatest part about the process. Yeah, well, this isn't meant to be a process that we worry too much about, right? Yeah. And are you have putting words? Yeah. Sorry, are you putting words on there, Carissa? Like, I don't, I don't have any words yet. I'm going to do a word. I'm going to do the word lion. I just haven't got to the point of adding lion. Okay. I'll show you guys my my work in progress. For some reason, I really like to juxtapose this kind of weird green with hot pink. I'm experimenting with it. I feel like the marks that my pencil made when I accidentally rolled the paper over top of it are like my favorite part of this one. <laughs> um, it is neat. No. And I, I always find these that, you know, I get attached to parts of it that I really love. Um, this one's really nice with the word. word doing this, um, the yellow came out so nice. It doesn't it Oh, yes. Yep. It's fun to see it uh, in process on the screen, but also be able to look at well, it. Up close, right? And uh, that makes a difference. That's beautiful. Wow. It's funny how these kind of things can inform other paintings. You know, when I did my painting performance last weekend, it was like, how, what am I doing that, what decisions that I'm, am I making? And these moments, these kinds of work, like exercises help me categorize good um, choices for myself. So Leah, when you talked about George Foreman, the only thing that comes to mind is the George Foreman grill. Yep, that's his current, that's his current incarnation. But he was the baddest ass boxer in the 70s that, that existed. He was the strongest, oh. the fastest, the most skilled, the most experienced. He was a powerhouse. And Muhammad Ali was this young, scrappy kid who challenged him and did your, um, documentary, did it talk about why they chose africa um yeah they wanted to um and it's interesting because it's the africa of mobutu that absolutely horrible dictator the horrible evil dictator uh who ran that country um I mean, yeah, they wanted to, I, I, the two fighters were black. They wanted to connect with Africa and you see, and their African roots. And, and it was a profound experience for both of them. You could see it. Uh, it blew Muhammad Ali's mind away. I mean, I think after that, he became a, he worked with Malcolm X. He became a teacher and an educator, and he was very dedicated to, that's why the people loved him so much. He just spent all his time out hanging out with people in Africa and he would joke with them. And since he just talked to Blue Streak, he never stopped talking ever, never shut his mouth. When I went to Madagascar and I could not speak the language that I, of the place that I was in, it's amazing how you connect with people when you cannot use words. Yeah. Well, yeah. And yeah. I remember you know, I was there for six weeks and we spent it in different parts of Madagascar, but we were in my then girlfriend's village at the time. And uh, so she had like a family that kind of took her in during her Peace Corps service. And she said through a translator, of course, which is Corey, that um, 
she was really interested in the how much of me they felt like they knew even though I couldn't communicate through words mm -hmm. yeah. and I wonder about that with like going there to this other place and these subtle things that we naturally do and how they communicate and if there was a, a like a home that was found for him you know it was absolutely true there was a home that a connection was found for him and it was a moment he talks about it because he talks about everything. He does talk about it in the film, you'll see it. Um, you see it in the way he is so exuberantly interacting with everyone all the time. But this was a mind blowing experience for him to be in a, in a all, you know, to see like the roots of the cultures that had been taken away from the people who had gone to America. So it, so it was, and he talked about it and he was like, you think, you know, there's no connections there, but there are, and it's profound and it made him want to fix everything. It made him, I, you know, uh, for, for Africa, for that, for Zaire, it was like, wow, there's this like eyes are on Zaire in a way there never had been before. Right. And Pharma kept saying, you know, I'm black too, <laughs> but why is nobody like me? You know, I'm black too, but like, why is nobody like me? But he was very aloof. You know, he was like the person who wouldn't necessarily come out, right? Ali was like just right out there talking, running, and he worked so hard. Like he's just yeah. he was like, he, so it's like he had this energy in him all the time that was so intense. He couldn't stop. Right. He couldn't stop talking, but he was also always fighting. George Foreman was this very different, like quiet, almost Buddhist. Like it wasn't bad or anything. It was, di you know, dip, you know, he just, different. yeah, it was just, they got their energy from different places. Uh, they got it. They were internalized and, um, and uh, yeah, George Foreman, but George Foreman was the best. And Ali was like, I'm going to make my name for myself by challenging the best. And we're going to do it in Africa to bring attention to Africa. And, and uh, what has happened to Black people in the U.S. and the other places? And what is, where, what are the people in Africa? What is that thing that we have? And it was magical. I mean, you know, Africa is a pretty magical place. Like the, the sort of cultures of Africa be, without sounding, you know, I mean, I have like, you know, my best friend is Kenyan. Like, I just, like, there are a lot of, like, I don't know how to explain it. It's a very, you know, it's, it's non, it's, um, it's cradle of society. It's cradle of human culture stuff. And that's the only way I can put it. And, you know, humans are both bad and good, right? Oh. So, like, or epic and like epically flawed. And so Africa has all of that, but it has that history that we can't possibly there's a connection that we can't possibly have. There's community, it's community oriented, most of the cultures, which can have that negative and positive sides, but like is a kind of a different, yeah. you know, the whole different way of thinking about the world. Um, you know, this friend of mine, it lives in the UK right now, and she just did a whole bunch of pieces, um, podcasts for one of the, the Horniman Museum in, in London and to looking at their collections. And one of the things that they found, you know, she's able to talk about is, for example, there were a ton of trade routes that went between Africa and um, all over the world, but, but, but because white Europeans weren't involved with them, it's not really discussed in history. But these were massive trade routes where lots and lots of, you know, interacting was happening. And, um, and, and you can see it in the, so, you know, it's just like a, they, it's just like listening to somebody who's never been anywhere or do anything to, you know, listening to Americans is like listening to people who've never been anywhere culturally or done anything and don't know anything to lecture you about what it's like in the big wide world, right? That's right. the difference and uh, good and bad. So he wanted that connection. And I think at that time, if you think about the seventies, that was so, he was epic. And you see what a powerful force he is. You can't stop 
looking at him like he's gorgeous and he's like just the shit that comes out of his mouth you're like oh my god what is he gonna say next and like and he's profound and he also is so cocky like most of like 99 percent of the time you're like how does this guy even exist <laughs> clearly he hasn't listened to anybody thing anybody has ever said to him about how you can't you know he's right like, He's like, I can be the fucking greatest. And I'm the fucking greatest. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. I'm so greatest. I'm so great. And somehow it just- uh, Obviously somehow it translated to energy for him. Yeah, and yeah. Like he had to, it all came out saying, moving, dancing. He was always moving. He never stopped moving around. He was constantly, in fact, they talk about it in the fight, like, cause he's kind of like dancing like this all the time he's like, as he's talking to you. He doesn't sit still. He's <laughs> like that. And, and he didn't dance in his, he, he, in the ring, he could not do it because George Foreman would have kicked his ass. Like if he had moved around too much, George Foreman would have taken him down with one punch. So there was only this kind of limited set of moves he could do, which no one thought he could do because he's, he never sat still really that long. So it's interesting. Yeah, he could control it contain it do you think anyway. that in this current world he'd be diagnosed with like ADD or something that's a good question um I would say no only because you got to watch him to see there are a lot of people who try to do what he does and they don't have the force behind like you can just see its force it's pure life force kind of pushing out of him so I would say mm -hmm. um um, I, I mean, maybe, but like, it wouldn't be pretty soon. You'd be like, no, wait a minute. He's kind of a genius. Like this is his genius. And the genius of George Foreman was so different, right? George Foreman was like collected, cool, calm. He right. brought German shepherd with him. Uh, uh, that did not go well over in Zaire. People were like, I, they don't like dogs because those German shepherds are often sicked on them by this horrible, brutal police force. You know, like there's all these like, but you know, uh, Why did hard, he his dog? because he loved his dog. His dog right. is like very much a part of his identity. Hmm. He was a good dog. <laughs> you like him, Krista. He's like, you know, he had his dog around with him. Like you have your dog around with you, you know, <laughs> Oh, African country though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, like for him, this was both of them felt like they were fully expressing who they were. Yeah. And, and that's why it didn't seem like mental illness or anything. It just was literally who these guys and they also were exceptional athletes, right? Like both of them. So like they had clearly already channeled this into something. They had genius. Involved. Yeah, yeah, but it was beyond it. You know, um, Muhammad Ali seems like a, a storyteller to me. Like, and the African people, I think, loved him because there's such a great love of the storytelling in the community, in the in the in the uh -huh. in a lot of African cultures. And I think it absolutely like clicked for him and them that this is like his role. Got it. Yeah, I know it's a, it's blew my, it blew my mind. I'm still thinking about it. Clearly. Mm -hmm. And applying it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Ooh. So, Leah, do you remember what George Foreman did as soon as he came out of his depression? If it wasn't the grill, I just assumed it was the. the... <laughs> no, it wasn't the grill. He was <laughs> a boxer. He had many incarnations. Let me look it up. No, because I was a kid then. So, and you wouldn't have been born yet, I'm thinking. So, let me check and see what he did in between that time. Well, and Muhammad Ali, didn't he end up with like severe brain damage 
Yeah, yeah. He had a, I, I think he had um, some kind of dementia. He had Alzheimer's, dementia, like it was. Yeah, yeah. So they, he was one of the test cases where they were able to actually connect it with his fort, right? So like it was a big deal because of that. He was um, George Foreman, and he's still alive, by the way. Yeah, he is, and in he's a he was a a boxer, an entrepreneur, a minister, and an author. So he did a lot, you know. And if you look at the pictures of him now, he's like this really approachable, kind of beautiful human. He still has a little bit of the Buddha in him. Um, so he became a Christian minister. Let's see. That's great. Thanks. I mean, yeah. So what do, you, what do you like about this guy, Cy Tom Twombly? What do I like about him? Yeah. I think that his work is super complex. When you actually read about it and you find out the things that he is uh he is addressing it's really uh goes beyond you know he also had the ability to really um tap in with his child self and really take that um take it with him also he really knew how to use color like his pieces when you see them in person are so impactful they're so huge um I do, like I said, I'm not a big fan of the ones that have the giant penises, that's for sure. Um, but I do find his work to be really inspiring and beautiful. So I think the process is hard. Like I said, it's not easy for everyone. It's really easy if you are doing an abstract landscape because you know what you're trying to do. It's not easy when you're trying to find new ways to have comedy, like to tell stories that are difficult. Well, and to reach your interior state. Right. To reach yeah. your interior, that's what you're really going for. Well, and like, um, for me, the, the practice of like this one in particular is really nice because clay is essential for new creative ideas. Oh, and, okay. you know, it. this is how you innovate. And by Twombly was insanely innovative. It could feel often in art like there's really no great innovative innov innovators anymore. Like everything is just so the same because of the internet. You can be mm -hmm. so influenced. Um, and his work is still very unique in himself. Okay. Where is he from? Sorry, I miss where he's from. Oh, he's from like Vermont or Virginia. Let me tell you, hold on. Okay, so he's American, all right. He's American, yeah. He just happened to spend the end of his life, he bought a a studio in another country and he really um and you know he he actually hung out with rauschenberg a lot so that's like a thing to know like that's yeah lexington vermont when he died he lived in rome italy he had a little uh studio and stuff there and some of his best work was actually made there the the pieces the 50 days of ilium are really interesting because he after he died, they found him them, and they were like, "Sai had sold them to some random person." Mm -hmm. It's it's hard to do it well. It's hard to make uh, impactful work that looks childlike and yet put together. And like, I always make smudges. I always get tons of smudges all over mine, so then it really does look like child work. <laughs> Oh, that's good. I've never heard of him. That's why I was curious. Oh yeah, he's a he's wonderful. I have one of his big oversized books about him, and um, they show his. He had a he before he died. He bought it part of an uh, art gallery and museum, and then of course his foundation now owns that. You know, so it's you can still see his work in New York City a lot. Have you seen Sai's work in person, Leah? I feel like I, there's a couple of pieces at MoMA, right? Yeah. Yes. One, it, it was quite a wild, maybe 
Is it that, um, is it the one about the swan and the woman? Yes. So that one looks familiar to me. So I think I've seen it. It is pretty amazing. It is a lot of fun to stand. So who do you think was like Sai, but Sai made it like in a way, right? Like who else like kind of had his style? You know, it's interesting. You can definitely, I don't know if you follow Julie Mayrudi. Oh she, yeah. I, no, but I, I don't say know her. I actually have two artists that I think are similar to Sai. So Julie May Rudy, what I would say about her is that she has innovated his style. Um, meaning that she uses a lot of new techniques where she actually turns these kind of scribble situations into um, screen prints and then she screen prints them onto her really big um, abstract paintings. And then Jason Craighead, who is kind of a contemporary artist right now, very much has taken size scribbles and his kind of rawness and turned it into his own style. Um, so both of those artists, you can definitely see how Sai has affected them. Yeah, okay, that's great. So they did a retrospective, uh, MoMA did a retrospective of him before he died. Uh, okay. and it looks like, I'm trying to see what other pieces they may have um, shared. Leah, you know. It always amazes me in studying abstract art how, oh, and one of my favorite pieces of size is this way that he takes a boat, like the drawing of a boat and really distills it down into, because he uses it um, in some of his paintings. And let me see if I can find a, a really good image of it. It's so beautiful in the way that we can take something we know what it is and make it different, you know? Yeah. It is. You can't paint like um, another artist. Like that definitely is true. If you're lucky, you can paint like yourself. <laughs> How do you discover who yourself is? <laughs> uh, it's a combination of intentional work. And classes like this, this is the reason that we're looking at what other artists have done is, is because okay. through your own explorations, you're going to find kind of pieces that you think remind you of yourself, you know? Yeah. Like, look at these pieces that he did here. Look at that. Look at the sketches. That. You know, oh, those and, are nice. I like those. Right. And isn't it beautiful? Like on this blue background and, you know, you can see the oars and you can see the struggle of it. You know, there's a, they're really emotive. He did a ton of this, the sketches. These are his actual sketches. This is what I was talking about. Like he would really work an idea until he found the absolute perfect version of the idea. Like they have, I don't know, 30 or 40 of his sketches here, clearly. Um, all the same kind of thing, you know, just working it over and over again. I think it comes from very similarly to that. Um, there's one painting he uses when he finally puts the bow into play. Like really, he put it in a lot of his paintings, but one of them is really the most successful. This one's really beautiful um, that he uses Oh, oh, I like that. I like the color in that. And you can see how that boat is in play. So he was working really oh, hard. Okay. You can see comes, and that's one's called Coronation of Secestris. A lot of times, and this is, look, it's wax crayon and lead pencil and acrylic on canvas. Yep. A lot of times, you know, it's important to see how an artist practice has developed who they are, you know, and mm. implement some of those ways because you're only through serious repetition will you ever find yourself, honestly. Like, look at these. These are his, some of the bigger paintings that he did of the little boats. Oh, I like these. Yeah. You see how large they are. Not like he just went and scribbled it. No. He worked and worked and worked and worked till he got. I mean, and look at these paintings. Like, yeah. 
I cannot. Is that, is that oil or is it, what is it? It, so he uses everything as the problem. So you really have to look in the notes of all of his paintings because he used house paint, he used acrylic and he used wax crayon. And like, these look like something a little kid is trying to draw some, something, you know, and he's, he's going through the sun. These are the, he, like a sun series that he's going through, which again, he's, he's working that symbol that we all know. Right. And he's really making it you know and something about like this one is so simple and beautiful there's the boat again yeah it's just so hugely impactful so the point so nina to go back to your question which is a good question it starts with repetition of imagery repetition to see what comes out so what yep. you're getting in carissa's class is what are the things that are coming out and how do i evaluate them and work with this imagery and it's similar to what I'm making you do when I'm teaching you how to draw or paint. Remember when you had to do a circle a hundred times, right? <laughs> yes, like my you circle. Yeah. A cir you were struggling to make a circle, like a yeah. circle shape with the pen. So they're all, it's uh, all that same. Good job, Carissa. That's good circles. <laughs> <laughs> Nina struggled with um, the pencil when she was a kid. And so uh, we've had to pick her, right? I never used it when plus I was five. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not in a bad way. Listen, we all struggled with something, right? I struggled with math when I was a kid, whatever it is. Like you struggle with something when you're a kid. Like you struggled with handwriting. You're not the only one. And oh, yes. Because you yes. Were born at a time when you don't have to handwrite, it was easier for you not to learn how to handwrite and you learn how to use that pencil. But ultimately, a generation of that. Yeah, so they took out those. They took out those skills that yeah. we're talking about the handwriting skills that really um, inspired size circles, and they took them out of curriculum. Right. We didn't have to do them yeah. Anymore. Yeah. They did. Yeah. It's really yeah. dramatic. So Our generation yeah. barely write. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, it, can't. it's not just writing. There's something that happens when you're holding an implement and you're looking and you're trying to recreate it, there's a whole set of motor skills that happen. And if it's harder for you, what your teacher should have done is sat you down and helped you do it until you, you know, had you repeat it until you got it right. You probably need yeah. help just repeating it, but it felt frustrating to you. So you, and you didn't have to, right? Cause you could type. So you just didn't do it. it but what that means yeah. is the whole brain skill was not activated in you. And so what we're doing now is activating that skill in all the different ways. So ultimately, you and Jean and me and Carissa and all the rest of us, we're going to draw our circles the way we draw our circles. But what I hope we're training you how to do is be able to use your tools, to use different tools to like be able to express fully what you want to do. And that's all the, so you'll still do it differently than everybody else. It's not like you're going to do it the same, but the, the, um, it's actually a process that can't be skipped over. It's absolutely something you have to work through. Um, and, uh, yeah. and that's like, you'll just see the more that you do it. I know that sounds kind of like, um, abstract thought, like it's not related to what you're doing. Oh, nice, Nina. Thanks. Yeah, no, no, I, I appreciate it. And I like the fact that, of course, you're showing us different artists. And Leah, you're very patient with me because it's a new skill that I know I'm struggling with, but I'm actually really enjoying it. You're surging. A, you show up to every class, uh, like Jean. Jean would show up to every class if she could, like, you know, from actually when Jean wasn't working, she showed up to every class. Like, <laughs> showing up to every class and you're improving, right? Yeah. If you're improving. Yeah you're getting better. And that's, you'll just see how quickly I, I appreciate that you have patience with yourself to allow yourself to learn this. Um, uh, because it will open doors to you that you never thought were, and I oh, mean, like, yeah. perceptive, oh. level, right? Like on a perception level changes. Everything. Okay. Oh, that's great. I already told you about the Rodney E move that I've been doing for 10 years that I just figured out. So. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> on my DVD. She thing, so, yeah. Yoga move that she's been doing wrong for because she was able to look and see his shape versus hers. <laughs> that's the I mean, thing. That's, it's that's it's, the visual. That's visual. Yeah. And I think that it really clarifies like Leah. What is special about this particular school is developed to help professionals think outside of the box. Mm -hmm. That's a really good example of how learning visual art can really help somebody in other other aspects that aren't art. Right. And that's why we want everybody to do it. And it's scary for people. You'll see a lot of people are not a Muhammad Ali. You guys are Muhammad Ali because you'll come to class. <laughs> but you know, like you're not scared of it. Like you're not, or you might be scared, but you're more scared of not coming than you are of <laughs> coming. But like a lot of people are really frightened by art. And I'm like, it's just too bad because it's quite fun. And next week, I am definitely going to do whatever the exercise is. If I hadn't had other things to do today, I would have. But I think I'm going to try to do the next exercise. Who are we doing next week, Krista? Do you know? I am really trying to decide right now. Uh, I was definitely thinking about Bastia uh, because I think that he's kind of an interesting next level after Cy Twombly. I, think um, I love Basquiat actually because I write about him and I learned about him. So yeah, you know, he nice. He's um, he's really beautiful. It's just what I try to do is is like I try to take artists that I think have impactful work that we can talk about the way that they're storytelling, mm -hmm. but that can also have exercises made mm -hmm. around them. Um, you know, you you asked about how to develop your own style. Mm -hmm. um, that I did when I was first learning to paint because I'm actually a self-taught painter. I went to school for sculpture. I didn't go to school for painting. I took two 2D two uh -huh. classes, which oh, was wow. my okay. introduction to design. Um, and when I was teaching myself to paint, what I did was I kept a like a, a sketchbook, a separate sketchbook where I kept pieces of sketches that I was inspired by in a book. And then when I was actually painting and I was struggling, say, with a, a particular moment in my painting, like I was like, what do I do next? I would take out my own book of the own sketches and all of the weird things that I had kept for myself. So I was resourcing my own marks, resourcing my own successes and resourcing my own ideas. And essentially over time, what happened was that there were certain things I really cared about that I kept continuously until now. And now I'm at a point where I've been thinking about this. I'm going through this weird stripe phase where I've started using stripes in my work as translucent and opaque, both seeing through the stripe, seeing what's underneath the stripe, not seeing what's underneath the stripe, but having something else come through maybe on the side of the stripe. And I've been thinking about reintroducing a lot of spray paint and stencils. I'm at a point in my career though where I'm not gonna buy pre-bought stencils. We bought a fancy Cricut, it will cut stencils. Mm -hmm. I just can make them now with my own marks. So I um, will probably digitally create marks that I continuously use and then have the Cricut turn it into a stencil for me. So I'm resourcing my own work. <laughs> That's great. That's, that's, that's so great to hear. And you will, we're giving you little tiny pieces and ways to think that are very, there's method behind them, right? There's a logic behind them. There are rules behind them, but it's mm. a different set of rules than you were taught in school. So they are, there's a whole logical, uh, adding a new way of, perceiving perception i like the abstract class it's even better than i thought because it's absolutely building upon everything we're doing i think it's actually teaching you guys about color and shape and white space and lime and all of those things uh in a way that sometimes it's easy to get lost in when you're drawing a figurative piece like it, I can see you guys getting places. Uh, Jean, particularly you, I'm watching you really start mm -hmm. to understand color in a way in all your work and line in a way that's nice. 
Carissa, I like it. Oh, I love that one, Jean. Ha! Wow. Tonya, you know, it's an interesting, um, abstract art's an interesting experience because you think that it's going to be easier than it is always. And I knew going into today that it might be a frustrate. It might be frustrating for people, um, just because of the nature of of it. Um, Sai makes it look like it's so easy. Like we should just all be able to just get in there and make perfect work. This one's actually really enjoyable. This one really comes through on the whole concept of what I was thinking about, which is really quite amazing, huh? Yep. Krista, but you're, I feel like even over the time I've known you, I've watched your compositional, your, you know what you're doing, your direction becoming yeah. like sort of clearer and clearer and clearer as we get, you know, like super clear. Like I never don't know what, I mean, I'm always clear when I'm looking at your work. That yeah. I'm working a lot on exercises, honestly. And I know that sounds weird to say, mm -hmm. but um, I'm working on the technical part of being an artist, right. having a practice and doing exercises, paying attention, studying. I'm reading a lot more than I ever did before. So I'm hoping that these things are coming through. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, rice paper is nice because it kind of um, allows the stuff underneath it to go through. So it's slightly transparent. Yep. Nice. So it's nice that way. Oh, good class. Was a good but class. How, can, how can it not be if it's Cy Fombly? I mean, let's, let's be real. He's freaking brilliant and wonderful. Um, and thank you guys for the questions. They're good questions. This is what we should be talking about too. Good to talk about these ideas. That's great because I always have lots of questions. <laughs> That's good. To talk about this is good questions, right? To try and, uh, in fact, we have to ask the questions even to know what the real question is, right? Like the one question uh, would be this one thing, but really, you know, there's a deeper question underneath. So we ask, we talk, we go through. Um, we're the Muhammad Ali's. Oh, no, we're not trash talking. <laughs> be on this metaphor for a while. It's gonna be my yep. When I see a movie that I like, it kind of goes right in. <laughs> I love it. I love that this is like the. This is the one. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. You know. Well. I I'm enjoying just working on individual tiny little moments and figuring out what they are, you know? Yeah. Well, the tiny little moments are often the bit, there's a bigger, there's a connection, there's a pattern in them leading to the bigger yeah. moments. I love all the weird things I'm creating for this class and I'm coming up with like the weirdest little collection of random paintings. And it's really funny because some of them are hanging up in my um, studio and people are like, what is were that? You <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I was like, oh, I, I teach once a week and you know, that was so-and-so's week or whatnot. <laughs> Can I ask you guys something? <laughs> Not like another. No, so I'm at a friend's house. I'm sorry, that's why you can hear birds. Um, nice. There's, there's budgies. I don't know if you can hear them. Oh, totally. We can okay. So, all right. <laughs> so, but my friend actually did something. Can I share it? Sure. Her name is also Jean. So that's why when you said Jean, it's like, ooh. That is That's what she did. So she can tell you about it. If it's good, I'll take total credit for it. Don't okay, worry. Jean, look what you did. You did another one. <laughs> uh, yeah, tell us about this. Oh, this, is, um, this oh. is some from some art therapy um, that I did in a hospital at a very crisis time in my life. And um, so 
that was the matter of it. And the word is masked and raped. Um, mm -hmm. And as I was doing it, I saw a face come out in it. So I out, outlined that and some hands come out in it. So and at the time I was doing crazy things like trying to be Picasso and drawing <laughs> triangles and Poro and <laughs> everything. It's a lovely, it's a really compelling piece. Actually, the pieces out of this class may be my favorite so far. I thought it was going to be hard, but I like what's happening in this class. Jean, this one that you just sent over with the black marks and the blue and the green and the sort of yellow is like, I can't stop staring at it. Good. It's the second one. Did you yeah. see it? It's really, yeah. it's for some reason, this like blew you open. <laughs> This one little spot. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah. Not very interesting. Yeah. Almost kind of dirty in spots too, which is, you know. Yeah. Good for me. I like that. My, my dog is looking at me in the face, being like, "Hello." Hi. <laughs> Who are you talking to us? <laughs> What's up? What's up? Staring at me. I'm making weird faces right now. Okay. <laughs> We're immersed in art. So, do you have an ultimate favorite? Does everybody on the call have an ultimate favorite, like artist, like the one that really gets you going? I do. Yeah. Okay. Mary Mary Cassatt is my favorite. Ah. I just yeah. blows my mind every single time I look at her. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Carissa? I could list the top 10. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let, do, you, do you have one like off the top of your head? I have one. I could list 10 that I would. Yeah. Do. Yeah. Yeah. List them all. This is fun. I, okay. I would definitely be one of them. Um, as honestly, would, so would Jason Craig, Craig, Craig's head. I always say it's not naming correctly for some reason. Um, honestly, when people ask me who my favorite artist is, I always say Lynn Jewel Hansen, um, who is a Dutch contemporary painter who painted for a short period of time and really hasn't, she exploded onto the world scene and then kind of hasn't since then. And um, she came from a real, uh, a design background that you can really, yeah. Sorry about that. My dog is being super sassy. Um, you can really see from her in her work and come on. So this is her work. It's super dirty, which I never would do myself. Um, she uses symbol symbolism really well, um, yeah. but she's she huge for a while and then just kind of seems to have stopped, you know, she's from Denmark. Uh, it's probably the colors I would imagine with myself, knowing myself, she's pretty prolific, you know. Um, she's up in my top, my top pieces of like true happiness. I'm trying to think if I have any like local artists that I really, really love. Oh yeah, uh, if I was to say a couple of favorite locals, meaning that they're from Oregon, Marianne Pulse is an artist that does some really interesting stuff where she dyes, um, she dyes rice paper and thinner papers with natural pigments and layers them. Wow. And the ways that she layers them are um, really mar remarkable. And then I also love this artist named Cicel Johansson, who's also a, she's a, you'll find her on Instagram because she's another kind of Denmark Dutch artist. And I don't like what she's doing right now. She's getting her MFA and she's kind of strayed away from what she originally did. Yeah. Um, but her original works are these like oil pastel splotches and it's evocative. It's um, remarkable what she's doing. 
but some of my favorite artists don't even make paintings, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Jason DeCartes is the sculptor who makes all of the underwater sculptures. Oh that yeah, that shit is great. I was, mm -hmm. uh, he's unbelievable. Kills me. The circle that he did Granada for the spot where all the slave ships would push slaves over if they were getting searched and whatnot. He did this circle of um, black people and they sunk it to the bottom of the ocean and then it grew and became a coral reef. Oh my but, God. Wow. It's you know, like so it's like it will you won't you won't be able to stop crying nor like right. It the work all of his work is super socially engaged in that way. And then oh god, there was this artist why can I not think of the name of her? I was obsessed with her when I was in college because she did these crazy videos of the Dead Sea and watermelons in her naked body. Do you remember her name? I showed you her work and now I can't think. It her all of her work is impactful. Oh Hart? Susan Hart? No. Oh God. Hold and on. I would say I would have to add Bisa Butler if we're talking about contemporary artists that are alive today. Bisa Butler. Who's that? Piglet Landau. Hold on. When I was in college, because I was in sculpture, when I was in college, we, I found this and I couldn't stop. And I just fell down a rabbit hole, obviously. Mm. It's three, at first you're like, huh. And this is, oh. she did a bunch of videos from the Dead Sea. And then you see oh, as wow. it comes out more and more. Oh yeah, that shit is good right she's fucking incredible and uh she i don't know what it's doing now but her work is Im impactful so i guess there's quite a few right there just right off the top of my head oh that's great oh i'm gonna introduce you to this guy you can tell me what you think his name is martin dammit i like all those names um that, I, I don't know all of them but i'm gonna look them up but this guy's interesting, and I, I don't know. Oh, his last name. D a m a n n. He's our. He's like my age. He's like in his fifties. Interesting. Do you have a particular piece of his that you really like? Um, there is. I gotta find it. A friend introduced me to this, and I, I didn't. I thought it was very ghost-like, but it's yeah, it is. He, he, is I think it, he looks what? Is it like watercolor? What is? Yeah, it's watercolor. It's ink. I think his style of painting. He's very talented, and he's a big a uh, World War II buff. Yeah, um, but he's very interesting work. Like you know, it's his work, which I I think is very interesting. I, I just wouldn't know how to replicate it. You yeah, know? well, it feels to me like there's got to be some serious process here yeah that we don't know you know yeah um I can't find I just like I just like some of the I don't like people as much in paintings I mean I like his because they're captivating I just love the color right he's got yeah. some that are just landscapes without people that I like but I just can't find them his recent one is about his ex-girlfriends <laughs> <laughs> Huh. I like that. I like the like, you know, getting out there and and making it personal. His his work is really interesting. If if you didn't tell me he made it, I would think that it was digitally altered somehow. But you can see that some of them are clearly watercolors. Yeah, you know, it's funny because it reminds me. It's not like anything I've ever seen. There's nobody who paints like him. But right. it reminds me, Jesus, Jean, got <laughs> fire today. These are great. Um, it reminds me a little bit of what I saw from the artists that when I lived six years in the former Soviet Union. So, uh, so I was there in, let's see, the late 90s and then later in 2006 till 2010. 
And uh, what I noticed is almost everybody had these kind of slightly obscured pictures that they were working with where you couldn't exactly see the figure. Everything looks a little bit ghostly. And I always credited that to, so if he's from East Germany, this would totally make sense to me. If he's from like Leipzig or something like that, like this would make total sense oh, with a lot sense. of different work, which is that so many lies were told to people and so mm. much re, um, uh, store, like sort of um, re, you know, working of stories happened that like everyone, no one was really clear on what was really true. So when they looked at their own family, they were often looking at a figure that they, uh, that's how it appeared to me. I mean, when I asked some of the artists, are you doing this? They weren't consciously doing this. But when I say, that's what I think when I see us, they'd say, yeah, you need to write an article about it or make people famous. Because it is a theme where pieces of, so it has that look to, even though I haven't seen that particular artist, it has that look to me of the confusion of um, what is, what's actually these sort of partly obscured images. Interesting, so interesting. I also have an, another contemporary artist that I fall in love with some of her work. Um, it's collage, it's collage pieces, which I don't always like collage. Um, I was looking through my, I have saved images and I was looking through some of my saved images so that you could, so that I could see. And this is Claire Oswald. Whew. That's and nice. her work is that's nice that's yeah nice. right and she's her work is really interesting i like the smaller pieces yeah. like all of these weird collages are really um oh of course something went wrong somebody was posting it that wasn't supposed to uh all of these pieces are very similar to like the concepts of of you know you make a bunch of the same mark you can see where she's working through this here right she's working through to figure out what is the best composition and then she'll collage it together. She's great to look up on Pinterest because you can see all of her collages that she probably ever put on the internet ever are saved forever to her own fault. Um, but they're beautiful. They make me interested in a color blue that I wasn't previously interested in, so. So interesting. I also really love Bisa Butler. I love what Bisa Butler is doing right now. I think she's one of the hottest American contemporary artists now. She's the lady who does quilting. She yes. makes, like she quilts. Um, portraits, right? So portraits, 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 old portraits of African-American um, pictures, but like, and scenes, but using, um, she paints, she, she uses, she puts pieces together like you would a painting lights and darks and all of that but she uses pieces from ghana and her shit is like fucking on I think fire we're gonna find a new um a new era right i think some new contemporary art world we're gonna see a lot of afrocentric work that is super dynamic and hasn't previously been able to come to the front mm -hmm. and i'm excited to see what some of those works look like um we have an artist showing our gallery in July, Lanisha Tinsley, and she is doing just such beautiful work. And we actually became friends because we're abstract painters, but what she's doing now is collage work about African-Americans using um, Ebony magazines from the 50s. Oh and God. those images, yeah. yeah. And they're so uh, beautiful to, to see them at the forefront. And, and we're gonna culturally see where she goes with it you know, um, Jonathan Van Ness from Queer Eye started collecting her work and then of course it blew up because it's a different world now. Yeah. Some semi-famous person brings it to the forefront, you know, and it's a big deal. Yeah. It is um, 5.30. Yeah, that's so, uh, Thank you, Carista. Do you feel any better after working on things for like two hours? I'm gonna eat and see if so that makes you feel better. <laughs> oh, feel better, yeah. Great yeah. work today, you guys. Thank you. This thank is you. my favorite. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, other Jean. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. 
Um, this was probably my favorite class in terms of what was the final results, even though I know we're not looking at the final results. I really like the final yeah. results on a lot of these pieces. So you guys did great. I loved it, everybody. It was good to see you guys uh, exploring new, new themes and, and ways of seeing. Okay, so maybe Basquiat, or if you can think of somebody more intermediary, it might be somebody else yeah. next. Okay, let us know. Thank you, Carissa. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. See y'all later.